Welcome once again to my podcast. This is my second guest, Dr. Hedda Browning. She's a lecturer at the University of Southampton. I'm very happy that you could come today. Well, I live here, so it was nice and easy. <laughs> yes. So, for those who don't know, Hedda is also my wife. So, we married in September. That's right. Two months now. Yeah. It's been a good life so far. Although we've lived in Southampton now for a while, of course. Not too far from the University of Reading, where I teach. It's a very nice city to live in. Are you enjoying Southampton? Yeah, I'm enjoying it here so far. Um, obviously, we lived in London before we came here, which was a little bit of a change of pace coming to Southampton. It's a little bit quieter here, but it's really nice to be able to walk to work and hmm. got a really nice big park right near our house. So, yeah, different pace of life, but a more relaxing one. Yeah, and what is this accent you have there? <laughs> Where's that from? <laughs> you don't know where my accent is from? Well, for, for the guests, perhaps. <laughs> yes, so I am Australian. I huh. was born and raised in Canberra in Australia, which, for those who don't know, is the capital of Australia. Some people get confused and think that Sydney is. Canberra, which is a little bit south of Sydney, is actually the capital. Um, so yes, I was born and raised there and moved over to the UK three years ago, roughly now, um, for a job that I took up and have now settled here um, permanently for this hmm. job. Right. Well, I'm very lucky to have met Heather, uh, probably one of the best things that happened to me in my life. But we don't want to talk about our lives here, we want to talk about philosophy. And one thing that makes you quite unique among philosophers is that you had a whole career before you became a philosopher. Perhaps you want to dive into that a bit. Yeah, that's right. So my original life plan was not to start out being a philosopher. Um, when I went to university, I studied a degree in zoology. I was focusing very much on um, behavioral ecology, animal sciences. And my plan at that point was to go on perhaps do zoological research out in the field, research into animals. Um, but while I was doing that degree, I started volunteering at the local zoo at the time. So one day my mum came in, she brought a clipping from the newspaper, back when people still got their information out of clippings from the <laughs> newspaper and not the internet. Um, and it was an ad looking for volunteers at the, the local zoo that had just been taken over by new owners in Canberra. And they wanted people to come and help out. And she thought I might be interested. And so I went along and yeah, basically just fell in love with that entire type of work, um, working with animals, spending time out at the zoo. And so when I finished my degree, I moved into doing zookeeping, which I did for a very long time before moving across hmm. to philosophy. So how does one become a zookeeper? Is it easy to get into that field? It's not easy at all. So, I mean, zookeeping is very popular. People love it um, for perhaps obvious reasons. You get to spend a lot of time with animals. Hmm. Um, that's something that people really, really like to do. And so it's a very competitive field. It means that there are many more people who'd like to take up the job than the number of jobs available. So most people who come into it, come into it through something like volunteering. So getting experience, work experience, or volunteer experience at a zoo, doing that work before they move on to uh, paid work and more permanent work in that area. And so that was the pathway that I took. I was a volunteer for several years while I was doing my degree at university and then started applying for jobs. So I picked up some casual work at that same zoo that I was volunteering at. Um, then picked up a temporary contract at a zoo in Adelaide and from there managed to work my way into a permanent contract mm. over in New Zealand and another one in Dubbo, which is a little regional town in Australia, um, before coming back to Canberra again and going back to doing some more of my studies. So, yeah, usually people who want to get into the field have to move around a bit. You've got to be willing to move because there are sort of fewer jobs and there's you know, you've got to go where the jobs are. So in that way, I think it might be quite similar to academia, which mm. has a similar sort of structure that, you know, it can be quite difficult to get your first job in there. And usually people have to move as well. Do you have a favorite zoo that you worked at? It's hard to say. I mean, I liked them all for different reasons, mm. I think. So, you know, certainly some of the zoos I worked at were smaller private zoos. Um, some of them were larger government owned. And they've got different pros and cons. So I guess working at the smaller zoos, you have the advantage 
that you usually have a bit more control over what you're able to do um, and perhaps a larger variety of the kinds of jobs that are expected of you because there are fewer staff there and everyone takes on more roles and there are perhaps less bureaucracy in place to take on new initiatives that you want to do. Um, the larger government-owned zoos have the advantage, I guess, of having more resources behind them, so there's more staff, you perhaps have a bit more free time to get in and do some of the projects, so, um, you know, animal training and things like that. So, and yeah, more support, I guess, for, for programs such as going overseas. So um, Auckland Zoo, for instance, had really nice keeper exchange mm. programs where they could send you overseas to work with conservation projects. So I think, yeah, there are those kinds of differences you see in different places. Now, did you have a favorite animal that you worked with, or perhaps species, rather? Yeah, that's right. I don't want to pick a single favorite animal. That feels really unfair to all of the ones that I loved. Hmm. Even picking a single species is hard because, again, you love different ones for different reasons. Um, but one thing, one thing, one one type of animal that I really enjoyed working with that took me by surprise, actually, um, and that I've loved ever since, is orangutans. Hmm. So when I started working at Auckland Zoo in New Zealand, I was put on the primate section there. And when they told me I was going to be trained on working with the orangutans, I, you know, I was happy to do it, but I wasn't excited in any particular way. But after working with them for a little while, I came to realize just sort of how interesting they are and like, what cool, cool animals, because they have this mind that's, I guess, slower than the mind of other great apes, like a chimpanzee, for instance. The orangutan sits and watches and they think things over. Um, people who talk about them often say they have a mind that's more of a lateral thinking mm. kind of mind. And you can certainly see, they just sit and they watch what's happening. They think through all these different options. They observe the people and the way they go about things. And I think then, you know, through that, come up with their own sort of ideas and solutions for different problems or different things that they might want to do. Oh, and that's quite interesting. So when you perhaps were puzzled by some of their behaviors, did it at all raise sort of your philosophical interest in the question of animal minds at all? I guess at that point, I think only peripherally. So, you know, I just wasn't familiar with the sort of philosophy of animal minds. And so I found it really interesting to be working with the animals and thinking about, you know, what are they thinking about? How are they thinking? But I think it wasn't until later when I went into, you know, back into studying and studying philosophy mm. that I started thinking about particularly orangutans through the lens of what I was learning. So originally when I went in to do my PhD, the project that I wanted to do was actually a project on orangutan minds. And so I was really interested, like I said, to me, they seem to have this ability to think laterally in a sort of perhaps a different way than other great apes did. And to me, strikingly, it seemed perhaps a more human-like way of thinking. So, yeah. so you say they think laterally. Could you explain that more? Yeah, so perhaps one sort of famous, perhaps um, not true, but perhaps illustrative mm. example is um, a story about a cognitive test that was set up for some different types of apes to solve. And they said, you know, basically it was, say, some, some favoured foods, like some bananas hanging from the ceiling of this room and some boxes scattered around on the floor. And so when a chimpanzee gets let in there, they can sort of look around, see what's happening, and eventually stack up the boxes so they mm. can climb up and reach the bananas. But, so the story goes, when the orangutan went into the same room, it looks around, looks at everything, looks up at the bananas it can't reach, and walks over to the human experimenter, grabs their hand, pulls them across, and <laughs> points at the bananas that it wants them to take down. Mm. And the idea here is that they're, yeah, they're thinking of a different way to solve the problem, perhaps, than the most obvious logical one. Right, and you say that's a fake story. I'm not sure. I've heard it told. I haven't had it confirmed. Yeah, I see. Perhaps we take a more careful approach here, <laughs> sort of just anecdote. Hmm. Yeah, so that's right. So, yeah, I'm not sure. But, you know, in general, orangutans do have that kind of property that they are the kind of animals that seem like they would take that sort of approach. And certainly they like to imitate humans as well, which mm. is something also that can be seen in some of the areas where there are rehabilitant orangutans that, you know, they, they watch what people are doing and try and imitate their behaviours um, and learning to do things, you know, like rowing boats out on the water, <laughs> um, trying to hammer with really? nails. Um, so all these sorts of things. And I could see that with some of the orangutans I worked with. So one of them had been hand raised. She'd come to us. Um, she was an ex-pet that had come from Europe. 
um, and had come to the zoo and she still had some of those behaviors that she'd obviously picked up when she worked with people and so one of the things she really liked to do is if we put a scrubbing brush in her enclosure with a little bowl of water is that she'd go around and try and scrub all the different surfaces <laughs> oh that's fascinating you must have had yeah, a lot of experiences with orangutans i guess that suggest that they're quite intelligent do you have other examples yeah i mean certainly i don't think anyone questions they're quite intelligent but i was still surprised at different times so You know, uh, one of the things that we do with the orangutans is we'd give them um, see, enrichment devices, so different toys and things for them to, say, extract their food from that would take them longer. Um, but we have to be careful because orangutans are very large and very strong. And so some of the things that were like heavy pieces of wood, for instance, so that they couldn't have access to those to be able to, say, throw them or try and smash them into the windows or whatever, we would chain and padlock them to the, the bars in The, um, in their inside dens and so then they could come and play with them and move away and one day I was there unlocking the padlock to one of those and the orangutan who I guess had been watching and waiting for this moment appeared basically out of nowhere came in snatched my keys and ran off with them now these weren't the keys that could access her enclosure so it wasn't like she was going to be able to let herself out mm. but what she did is she took those keys immediately over to one of the slides that went between the two dens and started trying to use it as a screwdriver to unscrew oh, the, the bolts yeah. in that slide there. And so, yeah, it was really interesting you know, thinking about that. She'd obviously seen this done somewhere. That she, that was the first thing as soon as she got this that she thought that she was going to go and try mm. and do is just try and mess around with some of the mechanics there. So can that be dangerous, dangerous at all to the keepers themselves? Orangutans definitely can be. So we never worked in with orangutans. We always worked what's called protected contact, which means that they're always on the other side of some kind of you know, secure bars or our window from the keepers. So if we want to clean in their enclosure, we would shift them into a, a holding area and let them back out once we were done um, because they're just, they're very strong animals. So mm. even though female orangutans are relatively small, um, they're still just extraordinarily strong and the males are massive. So yeah, the big males can weigh 200 kilos and mm. they have a hand that looks like this. And <laughs> so, yeah, you, you wouldn't want to be sort of in the same space with them just because the risk is potentially so high. And mm. it's interesting because having done that, having worked with these animals, I think zookeepers, you sort of get drilled into you, this idea that they're animals that can hurt you and that you should be really careful. And so when I went about 10 years ago now, to Indonesia to see wild orangutans, I think I was the most cautious of everyone there. So there was you know, tourists who went out to one of the feeding spots for some of the released orangutans to see them come up. And you know people sometimes trying to get up a little bit closer, get their photos. And to me, that was just horrifying, the idea of doing that because you know it's imprinted in my mind just how easily that animal could turn and break your arm or mm. give you a really, really terrible bite. And so I think, yeah, at least you being even more cautious when you meet them somewhere else. So what was that project in Indonesia? So I wasn't there working as part of a project. I was mm. there as a tourist. So ah. I came over. Um, it was with a sort of a, an eco tour, I guess. So they would take a small group of tourists to some of the regions um, that were operating different programs. So we saw one of these you know, orangutan release sites where they had these semi-wild orangutans that had been often partially raised in captivity because mm. they had been rescued as orphans and then raised and re-released. And so they were getting still supplemental food. Um, we also got to meet with some of the rangers who were working with elephants and who were you know, patrolling the local rainforests to look out for poachers and illegal loggers. And so the idea was to show us some of the programs of things that were happening in Indonesia while also helping raise money for them with the money we were paying to be there. Yeah, did it raise your consciousness at all about animal preservation in the wild, uh, attempts to perhaps rewild them when they're endangered? I, mean, I think these were things that I was already pretty aware of. I think coming from the zoo environment, certainly you know, a focus of a lot of the work that's done there is to work with um, sort of you know, wild preservation efforts, wild conservation, um, these sorts of things. Orangutans are fairly unique in that they're an animal that are being rewilded. It's not that common. Mm. So for a lot of animals, the reason they're going extinct or the reason they're, they're endangered is because of loss of habitat. And so you know, when habitat's being lost, 
there's just nowhere to introduce animals. You can't breed them in captivity and put them back out there. Orangutans are interesting because they have more habitat than the number of orangutans that are around because they are killed by poachers. And so what it means is that rehabilitating and releasing orangutans is actually a viable project. It's a difficult one because orangutans need to know a lot of things to Mm. go out and live in the wild, and that's why they do things like supplementary feed. But it means they are a species of animal that can do that. Right. So as far as I know, orangutans are very similar to humans in how their young offspring take a lot of years of learning before they are themselves capable adults, which makes them perhaps almost more similar to us than, say, chimpanzees. Yeah, and that's something that I was really interested in you know, when I was saying that I wanted to do this PhD project about orangutan minds, that was the, the area that I was the most interested in, was the fact that there seemed to be these parallels between the types of thought that orangutans have, this kind of slower, you know, lateral thinking, problem solving, and also the fact that they are these animals that have this extended period of juvenile dependency hmm. that, you know, is more than any of the other great apes, um, except for ourselves. And so I was interested in what the potential parallels were there. Um, that you know something about you know having I guess a certain kind of mind might require more time to learn and certainly from what we do know about orangutans it seems to be the case so they have different kinds of foods in their environment that can be difficult to find and extract which means that they've got to learn a lot of techniques for doing that they've got to learn how to mental map their environment and so my hypothesis was that they have this extended juvenile period as a form of um, apprentice learning and I take that phrase um, from my former PhD supervisor, Kim Sterelny, who had this apprentice learning model for human evolution. He thought that, you know, the way that humans were able to learn all the complex cultural things that we learn, I was in the beginning sort of scaffolded by this apprentice type learning where, um, you know, experienced individuals would model certain behaviours for the younger ones who were then able to learn how to construct these things in certain mm. ways. And I thought perhaps something similar would be the case for orangutans. And the other interesting thing about orangutans is that, you know, when the juveniles reach, you know, what would be roughly considered, I guess, the teenager stage in equivalent to humans is that they gather together. So orangutans are usually relatively solitary, um, but they get to these points where they will often be found quite close in proximity and the juveniles spend time them interacting with each other and i thought perhaps at that point they may be teaching things to each other as well um in the end the reason i didn't pursue this project is because there's not enough empirical data about what actually happens out in the wild with orangutans because they live up in the canopy so you know chimpanzees and gorillas have been relatively well studied because they live mostly on the ground and people can go and follow them and watch them orangutans live really 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 high in the trees it's almost impossible for a person to see what they're doing most of the time. And so we just don't really know if they're doing these sorts of things that I think they might be. My hope is that now with improvements in drone technology and these sorts Mm. of things, we might be able to learn some of these things in the future. And yeah, I'd like to revisit some of these projects, but I think I myself am not someone who's going to be going out, going into the field. So I've just got to hope that someone else does that. And then I can look at their data and think about what it means. It would be interesting to go onto a field site perhaps in the future if we get invited to something like this. I mean, you got this invite to visit the Apopo team in Tanzania that trains rats to find bombs, right? And I also got an invite to give a smaller talk. You gave a keynote. That was quite uh, interesting. Perhaps you can tell us a bit about that project. Yeah, so one of the nice things about working in animal welfare is the fact that it creates potential opportunities to go and do cool things where you meet animals. And so last year, yeah, yeah, 2022, um, I got invited to go over for a conference that was being run in Tanzania by this organization, Apropo, who trains what they call hero rats, who are trained to sniff out landmines um, in areas where residual landmines have been left behind and also to sniff out tuberculosis in samples from patients. And so as well as attending this conference, which was a conference both on the training of scent detection animals and of animal welfare more generally, we got the chance to go and see the work that was being done there um, to see these rats being trained, going out in their little field sites and finding with a really high degree of accuracy, very impressively, 
um, buried pieces of landmines and also within the laboratory setting looking for um, <coughs> tuberculosis in samples as well. And we got to see you know, how these routes were being housed, the kinds mm. of you know, enrichment and welfare enhancing opportunities they were trying to give to them and you know, talk to them a little bit about those things as well. And I suppose typically people wouldn't think of rats as being able to be trained just like dogs. So when we saw rats literally following other humans, the trainers without needing anything um, like a lion to which they're attached, really a rope or anything like that, they would just follow their feet. It was quite impressive, wasn't it? Yeah, I think your yeah, rats get, and so you know, they, they, these were, were giant pouched rats. They're not just the standard sort of rat um, laboratory rat or mm. you know sort of house rat that people might be used to but obviously a similar kind of animal and people just underestimate them I think perhaps because rats can be pests in human contexts and we tend to have that aversion because of it people don't think too much about them but they're actually very social and very intelligent little animals and so yeah they're, they're very easily trained they're usually very motivated to be trained they form social bonds they are very food motivated and so they actually are excellent animals for training purposes hmm. for using these sorts of things yeah, that reminds me of a story nicola clayton told me once so she is a, a very famous influential cognitive scientist at the university of cambridge and she has studied comparative cognition especially in corvids say ravens crows and for a long time these birds were just seen as pests right but really now we know how smart these birds really are so Perhaps there's a similar story to be told here for rats. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, certainly we see humans have biases towards and against certain types of animals. And so the ones that we perhaps like more, that we spend more time with, the ones that have faces that, you know, light up our cuteness centers or whatever it is, mm. people are much more well disposed towards than animals that we tend to have, you know, I guess agonistic, um, you know, sort of non-friendly interactions with out in the world that you know are pests and do interfere with different things that we're trying to do. Are the ones that we look worse on, and there just seems to be this phenomenon where people will attribute less intelligence and less capabilities to animals that they have a sort of a more negative view towards. And I think that goes the other way too, where people where people think an animal is less intelligent, they'll form a more negative view of it as mm -hmm. well. And so, you know, I think sheep can be a really good example of that. You know, sheep have this sort of folk wisdom that they're not very clever animals. And I think people feel a little bit of almost like contempt towards them sometimes mm. because of that. But sheep are actually, you know, much more clever than people would think. And, you know, they're quite social animals as well. Like there's a lot of things about them. They feel a lot of things that don't get taken into consideration sometimes because of that. I guess the same story could again be told for pigs who have shown to be very smart, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, pigs are incredibly intelligent, inquisitive, social little things. Well, not little, they can get absolutely huge. But yeah, because they're seen as dirty and because mm. they're used for food and again, they can be pests. I think, yeah, people just underestimate that. I don't think that's true so much anymore. I think pigs have gotten a much better sort of reputation in the public. Maybe, you know, Babe and movies like that <laughs> help the little pigs get a bit of a reputation. Yeah. But, yeah, certainly I think people don't recognize that these are animals that are, you know, just as intelligent as a dog that you have in mm. your home and just as curious and wanting to explore the world. Yeah, this reminds me of an influential Twitter account that's pretending to represent a, a golden retriever farm where dogs are farmed for meat. And... A lot of people have very negative reactions to this. Some are shocked. They think, oh no, how could such a farm exist? But what they want to get across is that we have these strikingly different attitudes towards some animals, um, say dogs, cats, we wouldn't mm. want those to be eaten. But then when it comes to pigs, sheep, it's almost like we want there to be a striking difference in, say, intelligence or other properties that would give them less of a moral status. Yeah, I think that's right. And um, certainly there is this cognitive dissonance that seems to go on when people are thinking about the difference between different kinds of animals. You know, you said that cognitively and emotionally, there's not that much difference between a dog and a pig. And so, you know, there doesn't seem to be good grounds on that for farming one and keeping the other as a pet. 
but I think people look for these differences because they want to maintain the kinds of lifestyle habits that they're used to and mm. the sort of things that they've grown up thinking are okay. And you know, pig farming being one of them, especially intensive pig farming that can be, you know, quite bad for the animals who want space and they want to perform natural behaviors they want to explore they want to do all kinds of things that they can't and yeah when people don't want to think about that they don't want to have to confront it it can be easy then to try and find excuses you know based in the capacities of the animal themselves to be able to excuse these sort of practices hmm do you have a hope for the future that these attitudes will change Yes, um, I think I'm relatively optimistic about this. I mean, maybe not completely optimistic, but I think there is a shift that we're seeing already. I think, you know, the attitudes that people have are different than what they had several decades ago. I think people are more aware of what's going on and they're more aware of the, the types of animals. Hmm. So one thing that I guess perhaps adds to this optimism is a project I was involved in fairly recently which was um, a report, so a team that was led by Jonathan Birch that I was a part of, was writing up a report for the UK government about the sentience of cephalopod mollusks, so that's sort of octopuses, squids and cuttlefish, and decapod crustaceans, which is um, crabs, lobsters and shrimp, and looking at you know, if these are sentient animals that mm. have the capacity to feel. And the reason for this is because the government was, after Brexit, looking to bring in some legislation to replace some of what that they had left behind in the EU um, to enshrine animal sentience in law. And what they were really interested in was which animals this should cover. And so they were already planning to include all vertebrates, but they wanted to think about whether they should include these invertebrates. And so we did a big review of a whole lot of evidence sort of, you know, over 300 different scientific studies on the capacities of these animals that we ranked against some criteria that we thought were relevant to sentience and came to the conclusion that based on that evidence, you know, there was enough there to treat these animals as sentient for the purposes of law, even if it wasn't a definitive proof that they were, certainly there was a promising enough picture there that meant that they deserved protections. And perhaps surprisingly, uh, the government listened to these recommendations and did add those animals to their legislation. But I think what was more interesting is the fact that when these results came out, the general public were really on board with it. I thought that some of the media coverage might be quite negative, you know, oh, they're trying to tell us that lobsters can feel pain, mm. you know, that people would be incredulous about this. And people just weren't. They were, you know, almost exclusively right on board. And it seemed like most people were quite happy to accept that these animals that are very different from ourselves do have the capacity for these kinds of feelings. And so if that's the case, then, yeah, my hope is that the attitudes we have towards the animals that are even more like ourselves are perhaps shifting in that way as well. So you, you talked quite a bit about sentience and the capacity to feel. Now, for those listeners to perhaps not part of these philosophical debates, could you define those terms a bit more? <laughs> yeah, the big question. Sentience is one of those terms that is excessively difficult to define in a really precise way because it does involve a sort of uh, a conscious sensation a, a feeling and it's been very difficult people have not succeeded at all in pinning down the words to describe that so usually the best way that we can do it is to try and point at examples of these kind of you know conscious feelings and some people would call this phenomenal consciousness so you know the, the fact that there's something that it's like to have an experience so you know, for instance, if I press on my arm, I feel that. There's something that it's like to feel that. If I press on the table, we don't think that there's something that it's like for the table to feel that. And the difference here, you know, what is the difference between the table and me and having that feeling? That is sentience. And so, you know, what we're having in common between, you know, smelling a fresh cooked lasagna or looking at the redness of a rose, feeling this pressure, all of those things seem to have something in common in that they are a felt experience. And sentience then is the capacity for these felt experiences. So do you use it equivalently to consciousness? I do, yeah. Um, I tend to stay away from the word consciousness and prefer the term sentience just because consciousness comes with a lot of baggage. Hmm. So people think of consciousness in so many different ways. Um, some, some people just think of it in this 
basic capacity to feel. Some people build in a lot of stuff, you know, because in humans, consciousness is associated with a lot of extra things. And they can be things like a sense of self, you know, self-awareness, a narrative that we have about ourselves, memories of the past, plans for our future, all of these things coming together and can require quite a lot of higher cognitive functions. And the worry is that when we're speaking about consciousness, people are often building in all these things when they hear the word consciousness mentioned, where sentience perhaps strips that away and allows people to think more about this basic capacity to feel. And I think then they're more likely to think about, you know, which animals can be sentient and perhaps think that simpler animals can be, where if you use the word consciousness, there might be some resistance to that. Hmm. But yeah, I do think I, I use the terms interchangeably when I'm doing them in my work. But yeah, I just think sentience is perhaps a little bit simpler for that reason. Yeah, I certainly noticed it with my own students where this term I taught philosophy of mind and the way the students thought about consciousness was a kind of rich sense of self-awareness, a sense of self, perhaps a kind of recognition of yourself in a mirror. Let's assume that other animals might not have this. But it's yeah seen as something quite distinct from something like a basic capacity to have any feelings. Yeah, that's right. And certainly you know, the thing that we care about or the thing that I care about when I'm thinking about animals and animal welfare is that basic capacity for feeling. So, you know, this is not a new way to think about it, but the idea that, you know, if an animal has a capacity to suffer, has a capacity to feel pains, it has the capacity to feel pleasures of different kinds, then that's enough for us to care about it morally. That's enough for it to have welfare that can be harmed, and that's enough to make it matter. And so, you know, all these extra higher order aspects of consciousness that we might build in might matter for other reasons. You know, they might speak to the kinds of interests an animal can have, but I don't think they in themselves hmm. constitute the moral value of that animal. Right. So then the question, of course, seems to be if this welfare matters for animals, and presumably we all think it does. It's almost like welfare is defined as something we should care about, regardless of perhaps what our moral views would be. Um, very few would think we should try to maximize pain in the world, after all. <laughs> but if this welfare is categorized in a conscious way, right? it's about this, the feelings of animals, how can we try to assess these in other animals that seem so different from us? Yeah, so I think yeah, this is the central problem that comes up when we look at a science of animal sentience or a science of animal welfare, if we think about welfare in this way that you know, welfare is about the feelings of animals. And I think that's an increasingly common way to think about welfare. And so for quite a long time, this wasn't done. People didn't like to think about it this way and scientists stayed away from it because there was this sort of idea that thinking about mental states was unscientific. You know, they're, they're unobservable. They happen in the heads of people and in the heads of animals. And therefore, you know, any discussion of them is never going to be something that you can get any empirical traction on. You're never going to be able to do experiments that tell you anything about what happens inside animals. You can only ever look at their behavior. You can only ever look at changes in their physiology. And so therefore, you know, what you should be studying is behavior. And, you know, this tradition was known as behaviorism for a large part of last century. It was the dominant tradition. I think it started shifting in sort of I don't know, probably around the 1970s, 1980s, I think there was this increasing push. Um, that's when animal welfare science started taking hold as a discipline. And from there, I think increasingly people have started to think that it is a valid object of scientific study, but perhaps in a different way than people are used to. So when you think about something like consciousness, animal feelings, you know, what you're talking about is not direct observation. Yes, we're not looking directly at consciousness, but what we can be doing is we can be looking at the effects of consciousness in the world. And so, you know, if we, if we take seriously that, that consciousness sentience is an evolved capacity that organisms have, I think that's reasonable to do. I think it's a complex one and typically complex traits don't appear in organisms by accident we can think that it appeared because it had a selective effect. It was selected for, for some reason, that animals who had this capacity did something better than animals that didn't, or perhaps did several things better. And if we think that, and we think that 
it must have been available to selection in this way, which means that you know it caused some difference in the behavior or the physiology of the organism that allowed this selection to even take place. Those differences are in theory also available for scientists to study. The big question is, the difficulty is figuring out what those are. And obviously that's really tricky because you know we can't just compare conscious and non-conscious animals because part of the question mm. is we don't know what those are. But what we can do is we can use we can use theories, we can use different kinds of indicators. So we can use you know, theories about the changes in behavior, different theories about the changes in physiology and bring those together to get a science that at least can make inferences about consciousness. You know, we may not be able to sort of make direct statements, we may not prove things about what conscious experience is like, but certainly we can infer things. Um, we can raise the probability, we can look at evidence that makes it more likely that animals have some sort of conscious states rather than others or are conscious rather than non-conscious. And so when we start thinking about a science like that, one where we're not trying to provide proof of some kind, but we're just trying to raise the evidential probability of an animal being conscious or of it feeling certain kinds of things, then it perhaps becomes easier to look at that. You know, we make certain background assumptions based on those. We look for evidence. We use that evidence to raise probabilities. Mm. We can test those background assumptions in different ways. And so, you know, it is this complex, multifaceted study that requires, I think, philosophy of science. I think this is the role for philosophy and scientists like these in helping unpack the background assumptions, justify the inferences, you know, figure out these kinds of things. And also just empirical work on a lot of different fronts to figure out, you know, how do we get at all the different aspects of this phenomenon? But I think it's certainly something that we can make progress on. And I think more and more people think this now, and that's why mm. there is this turn towards people trying to study animal minds and trying to study animal consciousness. Now you mentioned that here's an important task for philosophy, a philosophy of science to be engaged with the science. Many vi listeners still might not really know what a philosophy of science is about. Many think of philosophy as something you do in an armchair, you write a monograph about some topic and you don't really draw on that much empirical data. But you really want to impact the science and engage with scientists, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, philosophy covers a huge range of different activities and different subject areas. And so it's very difficult to say, you know, what philosophy is in a definitive sense. But I think philosophy has particular kinds of tools and methods available that can be really useful in these. And so we're thinking, you know, philosophers are really good at, you know, analyzing concepts, looking at what are the concepts we're using and what are the different ways in which those concepts can be applied, what are the distinctions between related concepts, you know, identifying, like I said, identifying the background assumptions that go in, you know, looking at whether inferences made between sort of evidence and conclusions are valid inferences. These are things that philosophers have been trained to do quite well. And so I think alongside scientists can help make progress on these kinds of questions. And so this is sometimes described as philosophy in science mm. rather than philosophy of science in that, you know, we're not just talking about science in general, but we're sort of getting down with the scientists in this case and really thinking through with them, you know, how to do what they're trying to do better and how to justify what they're doing um, and strengthen the sort of the concepts and the methodology. Mm. And so that's, you know, what I see myself as doing with animal welfare science is that you know I'm really interested in the way animal welfare scientists practice their discipline, the way that they're measuring the welfare of animals, and interested in how they can continue to do this and improve doing it. Right. Now, it might seem ambitious, of course, for philosophers to get involved with science and change it perhaps for the better, try to help scientists with the goals they have. Now, you are in a very unique position, I suppose, where you have this zoo background. Um, well, it's interesting perhaps to think about, well, if philosophers try to approach scientists, they might be wondering whether they would embrace them with open arms. Perhaps they think, oh, that's just a philosopher. What can they contribute to our science? What were your perhaps impressions of the field of animal welfare science? So, I mean, I was quite nervous about approaching the kind of projects that I do within animal welfare science because I was worried of getting the sort of response you talk about. And I'm certainly... It varies by discipline, but some philosophers do have that. And especially when you're working from the outside in, perhaps, you know, you're a philosopher who sits down and sort of writes about physics and then sends it out into the world, um, perhaps you get not such a good response. 
but I was very pleasantly surprised by how much uptake there's been of the kind of work I do by people who work in welfare science. And I think in part, probably what does help that is the fact that I've got a background, you know, with um, my undergraduate degree in biology, but also the time I spent working in the zoo industry as a zookeeper and also as a zoo animal welfare officer. So I was responsible for, you know, sort of undertaking welfare assessments of animals in the collection. So I had this practical experience of what it's like to be trying to assess welfare of animals and built a lot of my theories on that based on, you know, what it is that we're actually doing and how can it improve. And so, you know, perhaps for those reasons, or perhaps there's just something about welfare science being a younger discipline, um, newer, perhaps they are more welcoming of outside discussion. But certainly, yeah, I've found welfare scientists to be very, very welcoming of what it is that I'm trying to do. Um, and I try and, I guess, integrate myself with what's being done there. I don't want to sit outside and just tell them, you know, I know better than you what you're doing. That's ridiculous. What I want to do is, you know, meet all these different welfare scientists, you know, very, very clever people who are trying to do some really interesting things and look at, you know, why they're doing what they're doing and help them figure out how it can be done in an even sort of better way. Mm. Now, we're both currently engaged in a project that is actually trying to bring philosophers and as well as animal welfare scientists together. And this project is on what has been called wild animal welfare. Could you talk about this? Yeah, so you know, one of the interesting questions that's emerging in animal welfare is the question of wild animal welfare and you know, what are the lives of wild animals like and what, if anything, should we be doing to try and help them? And certainly the second question there is a very philosophical one. That's really a question for ethicists. And I do some ethics. It's not my primary area of concern. But, you know, the questions of whether or not we have some duties towards wild animals to help them mm. depends a lot on what kind of background theories someone has about what our ethical duties are like in general. But, you know, there's another question, which is the one that I'm more interested in, which is just the question of, you know, what is the welfare of wild animals like? And, you know, when I started looking at this, what became clear is that people don't really know. So there's perhaps the kind of the common unexamined view that I think a lot of people hold, which is that the lives of wild animals are very good, you know, that... They're flourishing. They're out there in the wild doing what they're supposed to do. And this is the sort of thing that I think builds up a lot of the opposition to zoos, for instance, that, you know, an animal that would otherwise be having this really, really lovely life out in the wild is all of a sudden taken into a zoo, kept in a captive environment and is no longer able to flourish in that wonderful way that a wild animal can. And then sort of in opposition to this um, has been a group of people who started saying, well, actually, you know, life in the wild may not be that great. And, you know, this idea here is that, well, look, wild animals face a huge amount of risks to their lives, to their welfare, you know, diseases and starvation. Things are hard. They get eaten by predators. They face natural disasters, all kinds of things. And if that's the case, perhaps the lives of wild animals are bad. You know, some people would say that the lives of all wild animals on average are net negative and they contain more negative welfare than positive welfare. And so, you know, interested in this question, um, I started putting down some ideas, which we then developed together and wrote a paper about, you know, we called positive wild animal welfare, which was sort of making the opposing case. But again, just from a theoretical standpoint saying, well, look, you know, based on the theory of animal welfare, perhaps there are reasons to believe that wild animals have more positive opportunities than the pessimistic picture would think. You know, they're able to engage in all kinds of positively mm. valence behaviours and activities. You know, eating food they like feels good. Exercising their agency feels good. Interacting with social companions feels good. You know, being eaten by a predator might be bad at the time, but it's a very short part of a total lifespan, so perhaps it doesn't impact mm. lifetime welfare that much. And so based on all that, saying, well, look, you know, if we just look at the theory of welfare and, you know, ecology... We can come up with any answer, really. We can you know, say that it's very bad, say that it's very good. And the bigger conclusion here was that this isn't a question that we can make much more progress on in the theory. It's a question that we need to make progress on empirically. And that requires us to go out into the world and measure the welfare of animals in the wild, different parts of their lives, you know, at, at moments in time, across their lifespan, 
and start just looking at whether or not their lives are good or bad on in total and then based on that we can start building theories you know we can start saying some interesting things about whether there are ecological correlates of good or bad welfare you know whether animals of a certain type are more likely to have a bad life than animals of other types that's all really interesting stuff but it can't be done until we have this data and so the project that you mentioned that we're involved with the scientists at the moment is trying to i guess help people make a start on that kind of investigation by looking at what the methods are that people can use to measure the welfare of animals in the wild so we have you know some sets of measures that are used at the moment to measure the welfare mm. of captive animals um, with varying degrees of success uh, so the project that we're looking at is assessing these different measures against some criteria that we've laid out and looking at you know not only are they good measures of welfare in total because i think some measures that are being used supposedly as measures of welfare probably aren't tracking welfare very well so we want ones that well, you know give an example good. for that um yes so um glucocorticoids is perhaps a good one there a stress hormone cortisol is often seen it's um measured sort of in the blood and this is a hormone that comes from you know activation Ooh. of the stress pathways in the body of a human or other animal and so you know very commonly measuring this hormone is used to look at whether an animal has poor welfare with the theory being that look you know if stress levels are increased that must be bad for it but you know a lot of people have discussed this and they say well look actually this is not a measure of how good or bad life is it's a measure of the intensity of the level of arousal of the animal is it excited because you can also see spikes in these same hormones when an animal is very excited about getting food or a mating opportunity mm. or something and so you know the worry is that you're not actually measuring the goodness or badness you're just measuring the level of excitedness so an animal might be very depressed for instance and have low cortisol levels or an animal might be very excited and happy and have high cortisol levels so certainly on its own this is not going to be a sufficient measure but it's one that's very common and so you know using something like that is something that needs to be used with caution I suppose that's similar to humans where in the past there's been a lot of talk about oh how we can perhaps minimize stress from different sources of life but of course not all stress has to be bad say going to the gym for instance that causes certain stresses on the body it certainly causes a stress response after all what is this huge weight currently on my body what is happening and then the body causes has a certain response to it as an attempt to build more muscles to perhaps not have the same reaction again but you also have a positive feeling typically associated with the pains or in distress right yeah and then I mean, that's one really interesting emerging area in animal welfare at the moment i think is looking at the value of challenge of agency of these kinds of things in welfare and so you know certainly experiencing some level of challenge is good for an animal so you know you don't want to avoid anything that might challenge or stress them mm. um, but there needs to be the correct level of challenge the correct level of stress that allows them to sort of grow and to overcome whatever it is whatever obstacles they have and that overall will be a positive for them and so you know figuring out where that lies can actually be quite difficult to do so did you ever observe animals in your zoo that preferred to work for some of the food items yeah so there's a phenomenon that's been observed in a lot of animals it's called contra freeloading and what it means essentially is that animals will when given the choice choose to work harder for their food than get it for free so it means if they receive their food say on a flat tray or in a puzzle feeder they will prefer to go and use the puzzle feeder and they will choose to do so even when the food's freely available there mm. on the tray and so you know what this seems to suggest is that the feeling associated with using that puzzle feeder is itself positive so it's not just getting the food but overcoming the challenge is itself mm. feeling good to the animal as well and i guess the the evolutionary story for this is that it's important for animals to develop certain competencies it's important for animals to become good at certain kinds of things that they're going to need to do across their lifetime you know being good at foraging being good at overcoming challenges being good at moving around in your environment all those things help you and so doing the kind of work that allows you to build those competencies is then itself positively balanced mm -hmm. and so yeah i've seen it with zoo animals where i've 
yeah, given these kind of challenges. Mm. So I'm um, some pygmy marmosets. I gave them little <laughs> forage boxes. So pygmy marmosets are the tiniest little monkeys you can imagine. Um, but yeah, and I give them little forage boxes where their food is scattered, sort of hidden in amongst some leaves and they've got to search for mm. it. They would prefer to do that rather than eat it off the tray. And other people have found similar things with a range of different animals as well. And many people might not think about perhaps boredom as an emotion other animals can experience. Do you think they can? Yeah, I think something like boredom. I mean, it, it's very hard to use human emotion words mm. and apply them directly to animals. And you get stuck in this kind of difficult place where you don't want to overuse human emotion words with all the sort of right. things that are built into that, all the assumptions that are built in. But you don't want to underuse them either. You don't want to assume that animals are like crazy different from us in such a way they can never experience the same things we do. But certainly I think something like a negative feeling that comes from being understimulated hmm. um, is definitely something you seem to see in animals. I mean, animals who have environments that don't allow them to do much of anything, don't allow them to explore, don't allow them to engage, yeah, show all kinds of signs of negative welfare. And, hmm. you know, what we would certainly call boredom if it was in ourselves. Right. I mean, typically when we talk about, say, the suffering of animals and farms, it's more about pain, it's more like these direct, uh, perhaps, harms animals experience, but perhaps boredom might be a great factor here as well. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, certainly, you know, there are certain kinds of negative experiences that are probably worse than others. You know, so if I was given the choice of experiencing a lot of pain or experiencing some amount of boredom, hmm. I would typically choose the boredom over the pain. But that's not even entirely true. So humans will, in some cases, choose to give themselves an electric shock mm. rather than just sit and do nothing. So the you know, experiments have done that, having people sitting there and essentially, you know, figuring out that over a certain amount mm. of time, if they left long enough on their own, knowing they can administer an electric shock to themselves, knowing that it's not going to feel good, they'll still do it just for something to do. And so, you know, given that, you know, people, animals will be willing to you know, essentially, yeah, do something that feels bad just because it feels better than nothing. Right. It's very strong evidence, I think, that a feeling of boredom and not having something to do is really, really not good. It's, you know, negatively valenced. It's something that's going to harm your welfare. And so, you know, providing opportunities for animals in any kind of housing to have something to do, you know, mm. new, new things to explore... Um, challenges they have to overcome, other animals to interact with is a great one, other animals are, you know, always interesting. Well, it does seem similar to, say, pecking behavior, pigs biting their own feet. Right, it seems quite similar to the human experiments where humans administer shocks. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, behaviors like self-injury sometimes occur because animals are stressed um, and frustrated, it's their only outlet, but sometimes they just seem to occur because they're really bored and it's the only thing that they can do. And then there's some kind of reward that they get from doing those behaviors mm. cause them to continue. What changes would you like to see for farms in the future? Uh, I, it's a difficult one because I mean, certainly I myself am a vegan, which means that I don't, eat any farmed animal products at all or I try not to do the best of my ability and so you know ideally I think I would just like to see a transition away mm. from animal agriculture at all but you know if we decide that that's probably not the most plausible path forwards in the near future um, certainly just a decrease in intensification I think the worst things that happen to animals in farming situations happen because the number of them that are kept and the density at which they're kept. Um, so there's been, you know, this move just over time to just try and get more and more animals into a certain amount of space to automize the process as much as possible. It makes sense that maximizes the profits when you're doing that. You know, the more animals you can house, the more animals you can process. But all these things, I think, lead to more problems. So you've got just animals being packed together in close spaces causes spread of diseases and you know these are mm. problems for humans as well so you know we get outbreaks of diseases that can affect people we get antibiotic resistance growing because antibiotics are used to stop the diseases that animals are getting from being so close to each other you get aggression between animals but you also just get these effects where you don't have the space to give animals what they need for the behaviors that they want to perform so you're know, thinking about 
the behavioral interactions that an animal has with its environment as being a really or with other animals as being a really important part of its welfare if you want a varied and complex environment that an animal is able to explore and utilize you just can't do that in an intensive rearing shed and so you know decreasing the number of animals that are held and increasing the complexity the choices available to the animal mm. the interactions that they're able to do i think are ways that you might actually then see animals in these areas you know having at least good lives before they're slaughtered for food which is you know perhaps not all the way where i'd like to see things going but certainly an improvement over what we've got now yeah one goal for this podcast certainly is to not only help us to understand the world better to bring this understanding scientists and philosophers provide closer to the public but also to try to make the world a better place right try to find urgent moral issues where we can intervene mm -hmm. now recently we've published an article on what is called clean meat artificial meat where a few will be familiar with this but perhaps to briefly describe it scientists are now able to grow animal flesh animal meat in a lab using uh, cell culturations and it seems at least quite successful there's now startups more and more research is going this more and more countries are allowing this to happen in the beginning burgers with this artificial meat um, perhaps artificial is the wrong word it's a more perhaps a better word is painless meat um, but they have been very expensive, but the price presumably will inevitably go down and perhaps that will eventually then yeah, bring an end to farming at all. Right? Yeah, well, I mean, this is one of the hopes is that if you can make an economic case for ending it rather than just the ethical case, then that may be much more motivating mm. for you know, many of the, the people and actors involved. And so, you know, if it becomes cheaper for companies to invest mm. in lab-grown meat um, than it does for them to invest in animal agriculture, it's just going to make more sense for them to do that. If they can provide a cheaper product to consumers using those methods, mm. then it's much more likely. And so, you know, it's looking at the change in the incentive structures, creating alternatives that, you know, people are just as willing to buy. And certainly, you know, there's some potential resistance to these kinds of products. I think people... You know, they're unfamiliar. They might seem a little bit unnatural to some people. Right. But certainly it seems that, you know, history has shown that the price is usually one of the mm. more important things here. So pe people buy what is affordable. Um, and if these things come down in price enough such that they outprice the meat, many, many people are going to adopt them. Mm. Yeah, I talked to my department yesterday um, about these issues and you know our work in progress seminar and some seem to have quite a vivid reaction to this idea of clean meat a kind of yuck response disgust but as we outlined in the paper this can probably be overcome and as others perhaps in our inner circles our friends family might start to adopt these types of food this disgust response might disappear similar to how uh, in the West uh, many people have this vivid disgust reaction to say eating insects right but then it's common in Asian countries for instance yeah that's right so, I mean disgust responses often just come from lack of familiarity mm. and so I think when you see yeah if you go to a restaurant and there are people around you ordering this kind of meat even if it wasn't something you yourself would previously have thought you know if it's on the plate of the person in front of you and they're just eating as though it's fine that's going to condition you to feel like it's a fine thing for you to order as well it's not going to seem so weird and disgusting it does right now because it's very unusual it's very foreign to most people but i think yeah the more common it becomes you know certainly there's a lot of evidence that people's behaviors are very strongly influenced by the social culture they find themselves in and what is considered normal for the social groups that they're in. And so as these things become more common, I think the people who have those sort of responses are just going to find that they don't have them as strongly and it's not going to be such a barrier to adoption. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose once we have that type of meat really being available in, say, the UK and the US, question you might raise is we could just get rid for instance of subsidies for the meat industry part of the motivation is of course 
for the general population to yeah, be able to afford meat. For many, meat is still something like a luxury product. So in countries like China, for instance, um, when the general standards of living went up, people had more money to spend on household goods and the like. A lot of people started to consume a lot of meat because in the past it has been associated as this luxury product, right? But once we have this artificial meat available, we could really get rid of these subsidies, after all. Then we might think, well, these are just supporting a particular type of meat that not only is perhaps problematic for environmental reasons, right, um, in, has a terrible effect on climate change, uh, but here also just the suffering of animals could be eliminated in favor of this kind of painless meat in a lab. Yeah, that's right. And so one of the concerns here obviously is transitioning farmers. Hmm. So you now we talk about subsidies. Subsidies are used, like you said, to help make sure that the population is fed, they get the range of nutrients they need, and especially protein. But it's also to make sure that people who are working in farms you know, are able to continue to do so and mm. to continue to provide food. And so, you know, one of the steps involved in transitioning away from so much animal agriculture is providing viable methods for farmers to transition from themselves, mm. from keeping animals to keeping to um, growing crops of some kind. And so providing, you know, both the expertise needed to transition and sort of, you know, financial benefits or um, support for farmers who want to do those things, I think is a really important part as well. You don't want to just sort of flip to clean meat, which has suddenly got mm. an entirely different body of workers who are able to, to work on that and leaving people who are currently farming without anything to sort of use their skills for and their, their land for. But it's about, you know, supporting these transitions and making sure that they can still make a viable living doing something else. Yeah, as opposed to we have this uh, great societal responsibility perhaps to make these changes happen in a way that don't cause you know, perhaps major disruptions right to the economy to workers similarly as opposed to ai right a lot of jobs in the futures might be replaced to some extent by ai right um, it might be much cheaper to use to invest into a particular ai app developed by some companies um, rather than say outsource that perhaps to a different country I might make this so much cheaper than hiring humans and again we have to think about the future of work here yes I mean that that brings up a whole lot of complex stuff you know, it's well beyond what I've ever thought about but the idea that you know what it means to work and what it means to mm. you know produce something for a society changes so dramatically if all of that can be done artificially um, and certainly, you know, we've got a history so far of automation not going particularly well for people. So, you know, the promise would be that the more automation we have, mm. the more machines do, the less humans have to do, the more free time we should all have. Right. And that certainly has not been the case so far. But, you know, with sort of perhaps a, a more radical rethinking of the way mm. that we approach work and the way that we approach you know, the way can people contribute to society and the way they get to share the benefits of the work that's being done by machines and artificial systems, I think certainly, you know, there are pathways towards that being a better future for people. Yeah, quite a few people in the AI industry, I don't know, Sam Altman perhaps said, um, open AI, I think have argued that in the future we'll need something like um, a universal basic income to be able to yeah, provide for people who can no longer work in the industry they've worked in their entire life, right? So that might cause major disruptions. Um, but perhaps to not stay on this topic for too long, one question we've worked on a bit recently has been this question of AI sentience, right? With um, large language models like ChatGPT almost seeming like you're talking to a human. Some engineers have even claimed that these large language models might develop sentience. Would we also have to yeah, develop perhaps policies in order to protect their welfare? Yeah, I think if or possibly when it becomes the case that we have artificial systems that are sentient in that they have this capacity to feel and 
they feel things with a positive or negative valence. I think that's important. Sometimes people talk about AI consciousness, but they're really just thinking of, you know, the ability to sort of perceive rather than to mm. feel. But you know, if all you're sort of doing is seeing and hearing, that's not really a welfare issue. There needs to be this positive or negative, you know, pleasures and pains kind of aspect to it. But, you know, if that does come about, then absolutely this is something we should be sort of morally concerned with. If we suddenly have the capacity to make artificial systems feel bad, hmm. then that's something that we should be avoiding doing. I mean, it raises these really, I guess, interesting and difficult to handle questions about exactly what it is that then makes these hmm. systems feel good or feel bad i mean when you've got an artificial system that's set up to you know perform certain tasks it may very well be that just the performance of those tasks actually feels good to that system right so a lot of people when they talk about you know ai welfare or ai ethics i think project a very human-like view onto the artificial systems thinking that like you know, being commanded to do things by humans is mm. going to feel bad to them being prevented from doing this and that. It's just not entirely clear that that's what would be like. I mean, it's very unclear what it would be like to be one of these systems at all. But certainly, you know, if they're set up such that certain tasks are rewarding and certain ones aren't, then, you know, just giving them more of the rewarding tasks to do might actually be a really good mm. way of making sure they have good welfare. Well, right, a lot of the literature and discussion seem to focus on how we might compare human well-being to AI systems. But perhaps if there's anything like AI sentience, it might be much more akin to very simple animals. Do you think the tests we have developed, say, in animal welfare science might be a better way to guide us towards how we might understand what it's like to be these systems rather than the sort of tests we've developed for humans? I really struggle with this kind of question because I think most of the tests that we use even in animal welfare science hmm. are based around a shared biology and some evolutionary theory about the way that animals have come to be the kinds of creatures that they are. And so when we're looking at how we study, you know, what is good for an animal, that's what we do. We think about, you know, what kind of evolved creature it is. We think about what kind of bodily systems it has that respond in certain kind of ways. And a lot of that's based on what we know about ourselves. And then we use these markers. When we're talking about artificial systems, all of that gets deleted. All of a sudden we've lost everything that we have coming out of biology. And it's not really clear to me what we're left with. I think perhaps one of the things, one of the tools that we do have that might still be important um, is preference and motivation testing. Hmm. So you know, one of the things that we do with animals when we want to find out what is good or bad for them, or at least you know what they like or don't like, is set them up with choices between different things. You know, Do they want to be in a room with a soft bed or a room with a floor they can scratch in? You know, which of these two things is more important to them? And even more than that, you can look at how hard will they work to get access to that. You know, how hard would they work to avoid something that might be negative to them, such as a loud noise? And you can start from that, building up a picture of the things they don't like and don't like. And from that, infer that these are things that make them feel good or make them feel bad. And perhaps for machines, you could set things up in similar sorts of ways, um, you know, such that they're able to make choices. And you can look at what choices they make. And if you run the background assumption that choice is going to follow or um, is going to cause certain positive and negative feelings of different kinds, then you might have reason to think that the things they choose are the things that are going to be good for them, all else being equal. Obviously, humans and animals make mm. choices that aren't in the long run necessarily good for them, but it's a pretty decent heuristic. And so, yeah, maybe for the case of AIs, we could do something similar. Well, Heather, we've discussed a lot of topics today. <laughs> so perhaps to end with one final question mm -hmm. what would be perhaps a kind of cause priority area if you think about mm -hmm. say the greatest kinds of suffering at the moment many people think AI will be a major factor here perhaps what would be your view on this what is the area we should focus on at the moment or where do you see yourself and where where you can see your contribution in making the world a better place? No, I think those possibly two very different questions. But, I mean, I think they're linked in that 
I tend to want to do my work where I think that there is the greatest need for change or for knowledge or for improvements. Um, so AI, I can certainly see what people are saying when they think this is a really important cause area. To me, it's still based on so many uncertainties that it's not something that I feel easy about, you know, pushing through in. I think, you know, when we look at the animal case, I mean, I'm an animal person, that's where my greatest yeah. concern is. So perhaps there's a bit of a bias here that I think it's important because I care about it so much. But I think I also care because, you know, I have reasons to think mm. that it's important. And so, you know, with animals, we know, we know that there are just absolutely enormous number of animals, you know, right now that are suffering all kinds of things. And that, you know, that is something that we should be concerned about. And if we look at where it is that we're able to perhaps have the most impact, so, you know, there are lots and lots of wild animals as it stands. We don't know whether their lives are good or bad. We don't know how we might intervene to change them. You know, what we do know is that intensive farming is something that affects lots and lots of animals in very obvious ways that we know a lot about. Um, I think at the moment where we have the most evidence is in intensively farmed chickens. Um, for numbers, there are just mm. more, more than any of the other terrestrial vertebrates. Um, chickens outnumber them by just a massive degree. And many, many of those chickens, especially um, some of the fast growing broiler strains, they're bred for meat. They're bred to grow so fast that, mm. you know, they, they are unable to meet their nutritional needs. They feel always hungry. They never feel satisfied. Um, they grow so fast that they're unable to move properly. Sometimes their bones break. All of these things, you know, lot, lots of things that quite obviously lead to suffering. And so I think there are some interventions in that space that are the sort of easier ones. In terms of my own work, I guess I'm interested in, you know, because I think for, for the chickens, there's, we, we know what's going on there. It's more just motivation to change. So I'm interested in, I guess, the frontiers in similar areas that we don't necessarily know so much mm. about. And so here I'm thinking about other kinds of intensive farming, which would include aquaculture. So I said, you know, chickens outnumber the other terrestrial vertebrates, um, fish, fish, um, prawns, all these sorts of things. Mm. There's even more of them um, and insect farming, which is an emerging area that could be affecting, you know, orders of magnitude more animals again. So I'm interested, I guess, in answering some questions about how important these areas are, you know, specifically insects, you know, are these insects sentient? Can they feel the evidence for at least adult forms of a lot of insects seems to suggest that they are probably capable of feeling pain or at least that we should take that very seriously as a possibility in our decision making for larval forms and juvenile forms less sure but yeah answering these kinds of questions and figuring out you know are insects sentient and what do we do if they are what's good or bad for them what are their welfare needs mm. i think these are some of the really important areas that we need to move into next i think this is a nice almost call for action not only for perhaps anyone at home to think about, oh, how can I improve the world? Perhaps no longer eat meat. Or perhaps insects all could also be a problematic issue if you think they have welfare. But yeah, you have an exciting research program. To be fair, perhaps I'm a bit biased because there's quite a bit of overlap <laughs> with my own. Um, but yeah, it was great to have you here. Thanks for coming this long way. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, all the way from the other room. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, and thanks to our listeners. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I hope you had a great time listening to this podcast, and I hope you have a great week. See you soon. Bye.